Good morning. I'm Pastor Sheila, one of the pastors here and, uh, at Living Home Church. And as Pastor Kirby said, Easter is coming. And between now and Easter, we are going to spend some time in our mornings together on Sunday morning reflecting on some of the famous last words of Jesus, some of the things that he spoke right before he died. If you've ever had the opportunity to be with someone as they're dying, it's an experience that might be uncomfortable, but it leaves a mark on you. Uh, I have memories of both being with both of my grandparents right in some of the moments right before they died, and we exchanged some words that will always be special to me, and always I will always cherish them. And so my hope is that as we experience this and reflect about Jesus' death and these things that he said in the last moments of his, of his life, that it will impact you and leave a mark on you, something that you will cherish. Because when we can appreciate and kind of sit with Jesus' death, as uncomfortable it might be, it's going to make Easter morning this incredible celebration of his resurrection and victory over death. So it's going to be awesome, and uh, I hope that you'll be here with us for that. But this morning, we're going to start looking at the first set of Jesus' famous last words, and they're the first words that he spoke from the cross. We find them in Luke chapter 23. And uh, we'll have the, the verses on the screens for you. If you have the YouVersion app, there's also uh, notes and the scriptures in the app. There's Bibles in the chairs, and if you've got your own, uh, whatever works for you to get, get yourself into God's word. But these words that Jesus spoke, we'll take a look at them briefly and then kind of back up a little bit. So Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Well, what are they doing? In the, in the previous 24 hours before Jesus spoke these words, some horrible things had just happened to Jesus. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends. He was given an unfair trial, which goes against our American Constitution, right? Everybody gets a fair trial, not Jesus. He was falsely accused. People just didn't understand who he was and what he was coming to do. And then he was beaten, whipped, spit on, hair pulled out of his beard, a crown of thorns thrust into his head, and then hung on a cross, nails pounded through his body. This is what was happening, that just happened to him. And in that very moment, what's happening, we look back and see this as the most historic moment of all time, right? Jesus giving his life, sacrificing himself, bearing the weight of the sin of the world so that we could have a relationship with God our Father. But the people who were around him were oblivious to any of that. They didn't have a clue what was going on. They didn't care what was going on. They were gambling for his clothes. They were mocking him. They were blaspheming him. And in the midst of all this that's being done to Jesus, he says, Father, forgive them. If it were me, those were not the words that would come out of my mouth. I might be more prone to say, Father, can't you see what they're doing? Make them stop. Father, why can't you send fire down from heaven and destroy them? Father, stop this torment. Save me from my enemies. Help me to endure this. Forgiveness would not be the words on my lips because forgiveness is hard. I struggle with it. I've never been physically beaten like Jesus was, but I've been betrayed. I've been violated. I've been deceived. And those are personal wounds. Very, and they, they hurt very deeply. And if you're human, which you are, you've been hurt. And I'm guessing that forgiveness is probably difficult for you as well. Because when... We hear about a drunk driver who kills someone, and especially if it's a loved one. We demand justice. When a friend betrays us on social media, we start to seethe and plot our retaliation, what we can do to get them back. Or for you younger kids here, maybe your brother or sister borrows something that's special to you, a toy or some clothes or a book, and while they're using it, it gets broken or destroyed. And in our anger, we react by kicking or yelling or hitting. In the moment of that pain, it's, it's so, the emotional and physical pain is so devastating that all that we can think about is making myself feel better, making the pain go away, making the person go 
away. The furthest thing from our mind is to extend forgiveness. But here we see Jesus in an unbelievable amount of pain. And rather than lashing out, he says, Father, forgive them. And I think if I'm supposed to forgive someone, I want to be right. I want to expose those who are wrong. And if I forgive them, somehow that means that I'm excusing the wrong that they have done or agreeing with what they have done. I think about some of the pain that you have experienced and what, Jesus, what it means when Jesus says forgive. He's asking you to forgive the alcoholic parent or spouse who doesn't treat you right. He says forgive the person who abused and violated you. Forgive the friend who lied to your face. We don't want mercy for these people. We want justice. And as I meditated on these words of Jesus in, this prayer, in, this, in, in, this, uh, in these moments and I studied them, I realized that it was a prayer. It's a prayer that reveals the always compassionate heart of Jesus, even during his most painful experience. It's a prayer that we can learn a lot from. And so I'd like us today to take a look at this prayer, these famous last words of Jesus, to see what we can learn from them. See, this prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross was consistent with teaching that he had given about three years earlier at the beginning of his earthly ministry in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus came was preaching before a lar- large crowd of people, and he was saying, you have heard this, you live your lives this way, I'm here to tell you a new way to live and to love. And so in Matthew chapter 5, we get to verses 43 and 44, and we hear Jesus say this, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. We all understand that, right? But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you, persecute you. So we get the first part of what Jesus says. Love our neighbor, hate our enemy. We're late for a concert, we're late for dinner, but our friend has saved us a seat. And we get there and we're just like, oh man, you are my BFF, I'll pay you back, I love you, thank you so much. And then we leave and drive in our car and somebody cuts us off in traffic and we demand the death sentence for that person. We love our neighbors, we hate our enemies. And Jesus comes and says, I want to teach you a different way to live and to love. And he says, love your enemy, and pray for those who hurt us. Pray for those who hurt us. So Jesus taught that in Matthew, and here we see him living this exact words out as he hung on the cross. I think it's significant to note that this recorded prayer of Jesus is very brief. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And I think that makes it okay for the prayers that we pray for the people who hurt us to be brief because the pain is real. And sometimes just thinking about that person stirs up such strong feelings that we can't do anything else but say their name. When I think about the people who have hurt me, it brings up feelings of anger and hatred and confusion. I don't want to pray for them. I want to hold on to my right to hurt them back. It was a number of years ago, before we moved to Madison, I was working with another ministry, and in that ministry, uh, there were some some local churches, uh, and we had some, some different opinions and ideas about methods of ministry, which is fine, right? Everybody has a different way of doing things, but there was some tension Uh, there was this particular individual um, that there was just a lot of tension in this relationship. And so I was at home one night and my phone rings and I I answer it and he's calling me and he starts interrogating me and asking me these questions and I'm instantly on the defensive trying to like figure out where he's coming from, what he, you know, where he's going with it. And, And it just felt very degrading the way that he was talking to me. And I hung up the phone and, and went to my husband, Jeff, and Jess, poured out my heart, and I said, I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense. Like, why why does he think this? And it turns out he didn't even have all the information. He was accusing me of something, and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't true. 
And as, as I thought about, you know, as I thought about that over the years and, and Jesus' words, pray for people who hurt you, pray for those who hurt us, sometimes all I can do, we'll call this individual Matt, sometimes all I can do is say, God, I know I need to pray for Matt. And that's all the further I can go because it just brings up those feelings. But the important thing is, is that I am acknowledging God's presence in his power to heal when I come to him and pray for people who hurt me. Now, you might be thinking, Sheila, you don't know my pain. You don't know what has happened to me. Where is God when it hurts? I don't trust him. I can't pray to him. And I would say, you're right. I don't know what you've been through or what has happened to you. And I will never feel your pain the way that you feel your pain. But I know the character of God. And to answer your question, where is God when it hurts, I would borrow the, fr- the words of Dr. Paul Brand. God is in you, the one hurting, not in it, the thing that hurts. See, if we don't bring God into our pain, we can't be fully healed. Because when someone hurts us, It's not just between me and that person because when someone hurts and wrongs and sins against me, they are hurting and wronging, sinning against God because I bear the image of God. And so when I honestly come before God with my pain, I find myself in the presence of his love and his grace. And when I begin to pray for the person that hurt me, Something supernatural happens that I don't understand and I can't explain, but slowly I am able to begin to loosen the grip that I have on the other person and release them from the wrong that they've done to me. Because as long as I'm hanging on to the wrong that they've done to me, I'm not free to do anything else. I'm bound, and I'm letting bitterness eat away at me. But when we pray for those who hurt us, God takes us to a place where we can forgive the other person. This might not and probably won't happen the first time I pray for this person, and it might not even happen the 21st time that I pray for this person. But as I talk to God and pray for the person that hurts me, God changes me and I will be able to forgive. Forgiveness doesn't always mean that the relationship is restored to what it was before, nor does it mean that that person's going to get what they deserve. Because forgiveness is not a magic formula that guarantees a certain outcome. We forgive because Jesus told us to forgive. He showed us how to forgive. So let's look at what was the outcome for Jesus when he prayed this prayer. How did that turn out for him? He asked God, forgive these people for they don't know what they're doing. The people that Jesus prayed for were not asking him for forgiveness. They weren't sorry for what they were doing. They didn't even know what they were doing. They were just carrying out the orders of the day. Jesus was asking God to forgive them while they were in the midst of their wrongdoing and their sin. And we know from the gospel accounts that Jesus' prayer was answered in the lives of at least a few that day. A Roman centurion who was working that day stood at the foot of the cross, watched the process, waiting for all of this to transpire, and at the end he said, surely this man was the son of God, and he recognized his need for him. Jesus was crucified with a, with a thief on each side of him, and, and they had brief conversations in those moments as they hung on the crosses, and one of them rejected Jesus. The other one recognized he needed what Jesus was offering through his death, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So for those individuals and possibly more who were there, we know that Jesus' prayer was answered. We don't know how it turned out for the rest of them, but God makes the first move and forgiveness. He doesn't wait for us until, until we repent and confess. He makes the first move, and he asks us to do the same. I find myself more willing to forgive 
if the person is coming to me. They've owned up to the wrong that they've done. They're sorry-faced and remorseful, and then I can forgive them, maybe. I find it much harder to forgive if the other person doesn't know how much they've hurt me or worse, doesn't care. And it's impossible to forgive the other person if we don't bring God into the pain because then we acknowledge his great mercy for us and also for them. And then we can begin to pray for them. Oftentimes, I don't want to forgive someone because I don't feel like forgiving. I want to wait till I feel ready. But scripture tells me that forgiveness isn't a feeling. It's an act of love and grace. But I fight that, and I say, but what they did was wrong. It hurt. They don't deserve to be forgiven. And that's absolutely right. Because when there is sin and there is wrongdoing, it needs to be forgiven. It needs to be dealt with, but not by us. See, when we pray for those who hurt us, God takes us to a place where we can forgive the other person and let him forgive the sin. Only God can forgive sin. We can't forgive their sin. When we forgive someone for the wrong that they have done to us, we're essentially letting go of the bitterness that we feel for them, and we are releasing them to the mercy and grace of God, even though they don't deserve it. Because neither do I, and neither do any of us, deserve the forgiveness. I believe that when Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, he was also praying for you and for me because we are among those who have hurt Jesus. We hurt him when we give in to temptation. We choose something temporary over his eternal promises. We hurt him when we lie and pretend to be somebody that he didn't create us to be. We hurt him when we disrespect another human being who bears his image. We sin against a holy God and we don't deserve to be forgiven. But Jesus, even before we feel remorse for our sin, even while we are sinning, he's already offered us forgiveness. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And Jesus prayed for us, Father, forgive them. And even still, Jesus is at the right hand of God, continually interceding for you and for me because we continue to sin, we continue to need his forgiveness. Father, forgive them. And if you have not experienced this freeing grace and forgiveness of Jesus, I want you to hear his words this morning to you. Father, forgive them. Maybe you've been made aware this morning of some wrong that that you've done and you need to seek God's forgiveness again. We can put our name into that prayer. Father, forgive Sheila for she doesn't know what she is doing. That's what Jesus prays for me and it's what he prays for you. He offered forgiveness to us as he was dying for us, and we can choose to accept and receive that forgiveness and live a free life empowered by him, or we can choose to reject it and live life on our own. But his forgiveness is free, and it's held out to you today. Will you come to the foot of the cross and accept his forgiveness? If that's a place where you're at today, I want to encourage you, find a friend who follows Jesus and talk to them about what that looks like and means. Talk to one of us pastors because it's the most important decision you will ever make. Because when we experience the depth of God's forgiveness, then we have really no other option, but we are empowered to forgive other people. And when we let go and we forgive other people, we're able to move on with our life and leave the outcome of the other person and the outcome of that relationship up to God. I'm going to ask you to do something difficult this morning and find some courage in your soul and think about someone who has hurt you. 
whether it's physical hurt, emotional hurt, verbal, something has happened to each of us that has hurt us. What are the words that you can say this morning that will allow God to begin to just even give you the tiniest bit of tenderness and allow maybe to begin to loosen that grip? And then I want you to imagine yourself bringing that person to the foot of the cross and hearing Jesus' words. Maybe your hands are still wrung around their neck and you're bringing them. Maybe you're dragging them by the hand because you can't look at their face. Maybe some time has passed and you're able to start to let it go. But imagine you standing with that person at the foot of the cross and hearing Jesus say, Father, forgive them. Don't worry about what happens after that. You leave that up to God. When we find ourselves at the foot of the cross, we find healing for ourselves and for our relationships. Because at the foot of the cross, there's no judgment, there's no condemnation, there's no discrimination. It's a safe place to be, which is in contrast to some of the, some of the places where we live and work. Sometimes we're, we're worried about what people are saying. We don't want to be hurt. We live among it in a society where there's, there's social divisions and of all kinds and, and relationships where people just feel free to say what they want even if it hurts somebody else. But when we all bring ourselves to the foot of the cross, we look around and we see that we're all the same. It's all blurred because we all need God's forgiveness. And no longer is it about me being right and the other person being wrong. It's about just receiving his forgiveness. And then I'm able to begin to pray for those who have hurt me. Because when we pray for those who hurt us, God takes us to a place where we can forgive the other person and let him forgive the sin. So think about what would happen in your family if instead of hanging on to everybody and, and all those, those things that dig and, and hurt us, if we began to release the people in our family up to God at the foot of the cross. Or in the workplace, if we could stop being part of the biting gossip that just divides and hurts and tries to get over each other in that competition, if we could let that go and be at the foot of the cross and release those people and the words that they say. Or think about our society as a whole. If those social divisions and social uh, the social hatred, those things could just go away. They do go away at the foot of the cross. I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning to go there with me. Uh, as I close in prayer, I will, I will ask you in a moment to stand. And if you're able to visualize and imagine yourselves and, and that particular person at the foot of the cross, and maybe you can even hold your hands out in, in representation of, of beginning to loosen your grip on that. Would you please stand together with me as we pray? Jesus, our great Savior. We imagine ourselves standing at the foot of the cross where you gave up everything painfully so that we could live free. But God, we get so entangled in our relationships and things happen to us and we have feelings and we get it all mixed up. So God, we just want to stand here in this moment and, and, and feel, experience your forgiveness the love that you're pouring down on us. God, God, we might need that just for ourselves this morning. We might need to, maybe we need to forgive ourselves for the way that we've hurt ourselves. God, maybe it's somebody else in our life that we need to begin to pray for. We need to hear Jesus' words, Father, forgive them. So we just ask God to be to be overcome with your grace and your mercy so that we can, we can begin to offer this to other people. Thank you for 
the example that Jesus gave us as he prayed those famous last words. And it's in his precious name that we offer ourselves and our hurts to you.